we're going to continue uh, what we began a month ago and looking at this concept of friendship, but in the context of the kingdom of God, so kingdom friendships, and looking particularly at the example of David and Jonathan. We set forth in a two-part uh, look at this uh, idea one month ago, and, and so we're going to conclude that today. Last time, we looked more specifically at David's role in the friendship he had with Jonathan and some key principles for how he conducted his life that helped build into their friendship in a good way. We saw that he had great faith in God. He was a good servant, and he was living for the Lord's purpose, and those were all three areas of his life that had contributed to this kingdom friendship. Uh, today, we're going to focus in on Jonathan's role. Just since it's been a month, let's uh, redefine our terms, if you will. Uh, the idea of a kingdom friendship is a friendship that is promoting the building of God's kingdom. What's the kingdom of God? Well, in its most general, broad definition, the rule and reign of God. That would be the rule and reign of Him in our own hearts and lives as individual believers as we grow more into the image of Christ, and also the rule and reign of God in our community, in our world. Today, as new believers are coming to Christ and His church is spreading and, and growing, and also ultimately, of course, when the kingdom comes and Christ reigns and rules and there's new heaven and new earth and, and all is made right. So in all those aspects, we refer to the kingdom of God. So how our friendships here in 2019, New Palestine, Indiana, our seemingly simple, small friendships can contribute and God can utilize them to build His kingdom. He can in an amazing way. And so we look to David and Jonathan as an example and try to gain from, from their lives some key principles that we can apply to our friendships. To do this, let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 20. 1 Samuel chapter 20, we're going to see several accounts in the life of David and Jonathan. So we're not going to read a, a lot of verses here at the beginning, but at least get ourselves rolling in the Word of God in 1 Samuel chapter 20. As you turn there, and we're going to start in verse 16, as you turn there, I ask you, do you have kingdom friendships? You say, well, I don't know, Pastor. I got friendships. Well, first question, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you a believer in Christ? If you say yes, amen, then my next question is, do you have friends that also follow Christ, are believers in Christ, claim to be Christians? If the answer is again, yes, amen, then you have kingdom friendships. The question then is, how are we building them? That's hopefully what we're going to help with in our lives today. So 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 16, it says there, And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul." We join me in a word of prayer asking God's help today. God, we thank you for your word and how it can encourage us in our lives. And today we ask that you would encourage us in our friendships, Lord, that you would challenge us where we need to be challenged to grow. Pray that we be encouraged where we see the fruit of your spirit in our friendships. God, we just pray that you be honored in this time and may you be glorified as we live out our lives and our friendships for your kingdom and your glory. Amen. So the first way in which we're going to point to Jonathan's life and say he helped build into this friendship with David in a God-honoring, kingdom-growing fashion is that he was willing to sacrifice. And so sacrificing is a way we can build our kingdom friendships. We saw this really to begin with in 1 Samuel 18. We looked at this passage last month and focusing on, on David's life, but in 1 Samuel 18... Verses 1 through 4, we see it says, and this is right after David defeats Goliath. So this great victory, this, this, this monumental moment. And it says, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. 
And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Sounds familiar. Uh, and Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and, on, and his armor, and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And we talked about how possibly symbolically here, David, in giving over his armor to Jonathan, yes, preparing him for, for battle in a practical sense possibly, but also symbolically we see the beginnings of Jonathan recognizing, realizing, and submitting to the will of God that it would be David to take the throne, David's reign. For Jonathan was the eldest son of Saul, King Saul, and it was supposed to be his, his rule, his reign. And this, of course, he's sacrificing. In 1 Samuel 19, the very next chapter, in verses 4 through 7, here Saul plots to kill David. Saul's opinion of David has changed from the triumph of victory over Goliath, and now he seeks to take the life of David. In 19, verse 4, it says, And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul. So Jonathan comes to the defense of David. If Jonathan would simply let his father take the life of David, that clears the way to him being king. But no, he was willing to sacrifice of himself good that could come to him. He spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant David because he has not sinned against you and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand and he struck down the Philistine. And the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David, and David reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought to Saul, David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. So here Saul takes the advice of his son Jonathan. As Jonathan risks himself, sacrifices again to look after David in this friendship. Then in the next chapter, chapter 20 of 1 Samuel... The top of mine, I don't know what it says in your Bible, but it says, Jonathan warns David. And in chapter 20, we really don't have time. We're not going to uh, read the story there, but it is high drama, all right? This is made for a movie. It involves arrows and uh, 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 secrecy, and ultimately, one great friend, Jonathan, being willing to sacrifice his own prosperity, his relationship to his father, his time, his energy, all to serve another friend, David. And it's an incredible moment. And in it, we, we see that Jonathan is looking after his friend David. But in part, there is some other interesting things we can say. In chapter 20, verse 31, I just want to read that one. Chapter 20, verse 31. So at the end of this scene where Jonathan has sacrificed for David and for this friendship, Saul says, For as long as the son of Jesse lives, that's David, on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. You know, the writer here gives us insight so now what was probably talked about and understood has now been said. Sometimes in relationships when there's disagreements and arguments and there's a subtext of people understand what's happening here, but someone finally gets to the point, and here Saul in his anger, verse 30 says, has got to the point where he's going to say exactly what's going on here. And it's as, soon, as long as this guy's alive, you're not going to be king. You're not going to reign. Well, for Saul... That would have been big and mighty words, right? Because for Saul, who often looked selfishly to his goals and his purpose for life, but for Jonathan, there's something different going on here. And so dad's words take a whole new meaning. And in part, it could be affirming to Jonathan because Jonathan is not simply living for David or the Lord's purpose for David, but he sees helping David, his friend, as the Lord's purpose for for his life. And so, as his father tells him, you're not going to have your reign. In his heart, 
there's maybe even confirmation that he knows. For it's the Lord's purpose for David, not himself. So we see in this moment, Jonathan embraces the role the Lord had for him, even if it meant sacrificing the purpose that he might have had at one time for himself, and even if it meant sacrificing the purpose that other people had for him, in this case, his father, Saul. Jonathan sacrificed for the friendship. He, he sacrificed, encouraged, loved David. And, and, and hear, hear this, that he did this naturally out of his heart that embraced the Lord's plan through faith. And this is so key for us if we're going to be a kingdom friend to those people around us or brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to embrace the Lord's plan despite any sacrifice that may require. And then we're going to be the best of friends. You being a kingdom friend involves embracing the Lord's plan, even if it's not what you imagined for your life. Even if it's not what other people imagine for your life, there's both of those tensions in our life at times. For we have our own dreams and visions of what our future would bring, but other people have those for us. That could be our spouse or our parents or others around us. And it takes a lot to let go of those or those dreams of others. But if we truly believe we're in the Lord's plan and this is the Lord's plan, then we're willing sacrifice. I don't know exactly how this may look in our lives, but I know that it can be a challenge. Have you ever considered that being a good friend or a a kingdom friend might involve helping someone else succeed? That's tough in our lives. You remember the uh, disciples, so you got this group of friends that some level of friendship, they've been called to, to follow Jesus and Remember how they were all arguing amongst themselves, and what are they arguing about? Who's going to be the greatest? And Jesus understands this is what's going on. The disciples are arguing about who's going to be the greatest. It's a common, it would be a common challenge to have difficulty in helping others succeed, especially if it's at the expense of our own glory. Maybe you're in a ministry here at church or in other places and it requires you to lead, but maybe sometimes you're going to be following someone else. Embrace that role. On a side note, as we're talking about these kingdom friendships, I think that it's wise for us to at least consider how this has implication to our marriages, to our role with our children and with our children to you as to your parents. Think of how considering your wife or your husband, your spouse, as yes in that role to you, but knowing they're also as a believer, a brother and sister in Christ. Thinking about how it ought to be your desire to have them become more and more like Christ how it should be your desire that they follow God's purpose for their life. And as husbands and wives, and even as parents and children, we come with that sort of aspect as well. I think it's going to build and grow those relationships. A word to myself and us husbands out there. I need to remember that although in in marriage we have distinct roles, that I need to listen to the heart of my wife because she is a follower of Christ. She has a relationship with God as I do through Christ. And so I ought to be careful and not just simply assume that my dreams or visions Our gifts are the only ones that could require sacrifice. I need to be ready and willing to sacrifice as a brother in Christ for the kingdom of God. We come to the table in equality to say, we both want the glory of God and His rule and reign, and so how is this going to be seen in our lives? And wives, with your husbands, be after their hearts. 
Are you helping and enabling, encouraging them to be more like Christ as a, a brother in Christ and seeing how you can help and sacrifice to allow them to follow God's purpose in their life? No matter how weird or wild or crazy their ideas might seem, right? <laughs> no. Sometimes our wives bring wisdom, and we ought to listen to that. But in our relationships, and it's interesting to think beyond that because as we look to eternity, although much of our lives right now is revolved around these roles as husband and wife and father and mother and child and grandparent, that's a lot of our lives right now. That's a lot of how we define ourselves. But how are we going to be defined in eternity, in heaven? We see that although for God's purpose in our world right now and for a lot of things we could elaborate on, we have those roles, and we need to do them as the glory of God, but ultimately in eternity, a lot of those roles are stripped away, and we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are fellow believers honoring and bringing glory and following God and Christ. I mean, it's interesting to look at eternity, how those roles that define us here are stripped away for other roles, and so in the life now, let's not look past those. And in fact, we can begin building those for the kingdom of God that will be there forever. So I want to build my relationship with my sister in Christ, my wife, for we're going to be that forever. Jonathan, it involved encouraging his friend's success. So maybe it's going to be seeing a friend's career take off for you while your career struggles. You'll be tempted to live in jealousy, reject it, and celebrate with them. Maybe it's seeing a friend's family take off while yours struggles. You'll be tempted to doubt the Lord and grow angry, but reject it. Celebrate with your friend. Remember that account of Jesus? So the disciples are all arguing over who's the greatest, and what does he do? How does the story end? He, he brings over what? A little child, right? And he has a child stand next to him. And he speaks to them, and, 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 he, and he says to them, that whoever receives this little child receives him, and whoever receives him receives the one who sent him, pointing to, of course, the Father. He says, for the, he who is the least among you is the one who's great. That's the message he says. Who's going to be the greatest? The least of you. Look at this little child. He's giving them a lesson in humility. He's saying, as he's going to demonstrate, as the ultimate example, you want to be great, humble yourself. For he's going to humble himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus sacrificed in that he is the ultimate friend to sinners. He was the ultimate friend to his disciples. When they heard that he might die, right, their response was, no way. we got other plans. You're going to reign, and we've seen the miracles like... You need to just take over, Jesus. You don't need to die. This is a terrible idea. But Jesus understood that his sacrifice was going to bring the most for God's kingdom, the rule and reign of God in their hearts and lives and for all eternity. So he did sacrifice, and we are grateful for it. So let's sacrifice, be willing to do that of our time, our money, our energy, whatever it requires to build the kingdom of God. A second way is encouraging. Jonathan encouraged David. We see that back in that 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 4. He had this defeat over Goliath. He encourages him and expresses his desire to serve David later in 1 Samuel 23. 1 Samuel 23, we'll read a few verses there. So here, David, remember our context, he's been anointed that he's going to be king. He's had this great victory over Goliath. People love him, are following him, but now he finds himself on the run from King Saul. Saul's trying to kill him still. Jonathan is helping him along the way to avoid that death, but he's finding himself running and hiding in caves and waiting on the God's timing for him to be king. It could have been a frustrating and difficult time. So where, how does... Uh, his friend here, help him out. Well, 1 Samuel 23 and verse 15 says there, David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness at, of Ziph at Horesh, 
And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. Now, the content of this moment in history we have is, yes, the gravity, it's, it's big, it's monumentous, and involves kings and people not being kings, and life's being threatened. So it may be difficult for us to bring it down to our own life and say, what, what, what does this look like in my life? But I think there are principles here to be applied. So Jonathan encourages David. And how does he do it? How does he do it? Well, look at the text. He does it, one, by encouraging his faith in God. Do not fear. You're going to be king over Israel. He went to David at Horus and strengthened his hand in God. The focus is on in the Lord. So when you go to your friend when they're having a difficult time and, 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 and they're struggling in life, this is a, cue, a, a clue for us. Bring the focus to God. Turn your focus to God. There's where their strength is. It could have been easy for David and Jonathan to be like, oh, Saul, yeah, your dad's the worst. Yeah, he is. Oh, man, like, what are we going to do? How are we going to beat this guy? But he doesn't. No, they say they focus on God. There is a mutual submission to the purpose of God and the kingdom of God. And that guides them. A second thing he does is he encourages them with the truth. So encourage your friend to focus on God and encourage your friend to focus on the truth. Because look, it's been prophesied. You're going to be king. It's going to happen. This is your destiny. This is what the Lord has for you. Rest in that. Have peace in that. You might say, well, okay, but when my friend has this trial, this difficulty, what do I say? I don't know that they're going to be king over Israel. You're right. That might be weird if you you tried to encourage him in that. You can't promise them, although some people might like to promise them wealth and health. I know it. I see it. I see it. Your bills are going to be wiped away. You're going to get that car you've been dreaming of, brother. And they may feel good for a moment. So what do we say? Do we have anything to say? I actually think we have a lot to say. In fact, in a way, we have more to say to our brothers and sisters in Christ, our friends, than even uh, Jonathan had to say to David. For we're on this side of Christ as Savior, so we can encourage our friends with the fact that they know the Savior, the long-awaited Messiah, and Jesus Christ has redeemed them. We can encourage them that through their faith, they're going to spend eternity with the Lord apart from whatever difficulty they currently face. See how we're turning their attention to God? We know that in addition to that hope of the future, they're here. Say, friend, I'm looking at you. You're here. We're alive. And with that privilege, and even you're here with all those problems, Yes, but because the sovereign Lord still has you here in His gracious timing, that means there's an opportunity for you, and His desire would be that you would grow spiritually and that you would be used by Him for His glory. It's an amazing privilege, a privilege that is experienced for such a brief time, and we don't know how long we have it, as Rex was mentioning but a privilege to be a part of here in this brief moment in this world to be used to build the kingdom of God, for Him to do that through us, to build treasures in heaven. And in all these sort of aspects of our life here that, although it's brief, is such a great and awesome privilege, despite all those problems you have, we can focus their attention on that. We can focus their attention on the fact that the Lord is with them. He'll never leave them nor forsake them that he's going to finish the work he began in them. Don't doubt that. As sure as David would become king, he's going to finish the work he began in them. We can encourage them with these truths. Now, 
A last thing, I think, in this little scene that helps us in our kingdom friendships or being a good friend is what did they do at the end of it? So, so here comes Jonathan. He comes to David. Difficult time. He encourages him. He focuses attention on God. He gives them truth. And then he just leaves, right? No. In verse 18, the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and then they separated. So what are you saying? We got to learn how to make covenants? I don't know. Maybe. But I think the idea here that, that we can take encouragement from is these two friends come together. They recommit to the Lord. They walk away, not simply like, well, yeah, yeah, okay, that's nice. But they say, no, we're going to make a commitment. We're going to make a stand. We are intentionally and, in, and mentally and in our hearts and our souls before God saying, we are now again renewed on this path. We're making a covenant before the Lord together. And so when your friends are going through a difficult time, that may look like a prayer you have with them. That helps recommit them and, and you to God. And they part ways knowing where each other stand. And sometimes we need to lead our friends to make sure they know where they stand and where we stand. Um, you need to have the DTR. What's a, what's a DTR? Well, I don't know how you grew up, but uh, where I, when I grew up in high school and college, so you have the whole dating scene and relationships, and uh, you know sometimes you're spending a lot of time with a girl, but... Um, you know, you don't really know, or are, are you just like friends? You need to have the DTR, define the relationship. And so, hey, well, okay, yeah, it's confusing. Darren, you need to have the DTR with her. Okay, well, I'll define the relationship. Or maybe you're dating, but you're like, well, is, is she dating other people still? I mean, is this an exclusive thing? We got to sit down and have the DTR. Or maybe it's time that we've been dating a lot and we need to get engaged. Well, I don't know. We need to talk about this, have the DTR. So maybe in your friendships, you need to have the DTR. You need to define the relationship. You're just meandering along in your, your lives together, and you guys watch football together, or you go to the shopping places together, or uh, whatever your hobbies are together, and it's kind of a neat thing, and you kind of both know your believers, but you need to define the relationship and that it's a kingdom one. And, and that can be difficult. How do you bridge that gap? Even if that's your spouse. How in a marriage do you go from however many years of literally your spiritual life and walk being kind of a sidebar to your conversations to becoming inundated and permeating every aspect of your life as a couple? Well, if you want that, there's different ways, and I think encouragement is a really good way to start. Because encouragement sounds like I prayed for you today. I'm praying for you today that you live in the Lord today. Or it says, you know, I was listening to this thing on the radio today and God was kind of teaching me this. What do you think about that? What are you doing bringing God in this friendship? No, God needs to be there in our friendships. So, Maybe it looks like defining that relationship that we are recommitting ourselves to following the Lord. So we see through sacrifice, through encouragement, we can build these kingdom friendships. Lastly, we're going to point out loving. So very simple, but very important. Back to the text we started with, 1 Samuel 20, 16 and 17. Here Jonathan makes a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. There's a love there. And in our friendships, we need to offer our love for one another. Through their friendship, Jonathan showed he loved David, a love based in their mutual love for the Lord and his purpose, a love that we ought to show to our kingdom friends. But what do we know about love? You say, that's fantastic. What does that mean? There's a lot of ways we could look at that aspect of being a loving friend, but I think if we stick to the Scripture, that's going to give us the best, the best advice. So 1 Corinthians in chapter 13, we learn a lot about love. What are they? Love is what? Patient, right? What else we got? Kind, does not envy, 
not boastful, some of the different versions, right? But not conceited, doesn't act improperly. A friend is not selfish. A kingdom friend is not provoked. He's not going to keep a record of wrongs. He's going to find joy in unright, not going to find joy in unrighteousness, but, but this kingdom friend, he's going to find joy and, and rejoice in the truth with his brother or sister in Christ. A good friend's going to bear all things with his friend. He's going to believe all things and hope all things in their friendship. Kingdom friends are going to endure all things together and their love will truly never end. So there's a picture of how our love can permeate our friendships. We can build them sacrificing, encouraging, loving. I've had the privilege of building and currently building kingdom friendships and I don't do it perfectly and these two um, sermons are, are preaching to me, first of all, but it is exciting to see them grow and exciting to be a part of that. I think I have one of those with my wife. I want to build those with my children. One friendship in particular, a friend and, and I, have, we became friends in elementary school, so that puts it about 25 years or so of building a kingdom friendship. Uh, and I remember moments of sacrifice, moments of encouragement, moments of love. I remember when we were at basketball camp together, and this was our first time away from our families and our parents, and uh, out on our own there, and you can get a little homesick, and that encouragement of a friend was great. He was the one who cried, not me, so just saying. I might have cried on the inside. I was strong on the outside. I mean, the room didn't even have air conditioning. Come on, but all right. But there was encouragement as young people. I remember as friends, we had another group of friends over, and there at his house, and uh, one, of the, one of the friends that was there did not know Christ as Savior. And I remember together sharing Christ, compelling this person to put his faith in Christ, and that young person putting their faith in Christ. I remember going on mission trips where the Word of God was proclaimed. I remember when his mom had a battle with cancer and trying to find the words to encourage. I remember the encouragement of, of him when my grandfather passed away. One of the people who came to that uh, service, even though there was a uh, important basketball game going on. I remember uh, some girlfriends that each of us had and encouragement maybe that was needed. I remember for him, you know, the encouragement to maybe leave some bad ones behind. And I remember supporting him when he found the woman he was to marry and, and, and being there that day and, and him supporting my relationship with Ashley over the years. I remember the voice of encouragement when uh, years through seminary and other jobs and waiting on the Lord's timing to minister and pastor, and I remember encouraging him through a variety of different life paths and different, different ways God was leading in his life. I remember encouragement when he had to deal with his sister younger sister being murdered, and um, that was tough, but that built our kingdom friendship. I remember fruitful conversations about the importance of the local church and to invest in that, and our conversations about how to greater serve God's kingdom through this thing we do. It's called church. So throughout the years, time and time again, we're there for each other with encouragement, with love, and even with sacrifice. And so I treasure those moments of friendship. I treasure those moments of faith. We have had fun as friends, and those are great, and we've had faith as friends, and that's great. And I hope and I believe that our lives are better in this short, brief moment we have because of that friendship. And of course, these are the friendships that I want more and more of in my life, and I want more and more of for you all, because if we all build these friendships that have at the forefront the glory and, the glory and rule and reign of God, 
then, wow, it's going to be amazing what God can do through us here at New Pal Bible. Because the community around us, our families and friends, our children, they're going to see those friendships and they're going to lead the way. People will hear the good news of Christ and come to follow Christ. People will be encouraged in their faith in Christ, and God's rule and reign will grow, and we'll all praise Him for it. That's the vision. So I hope that you've been encouraged through looking at Jonathan and David. I hope that some of these principles are things you'll continue to build in your life and build in my life, because I'm happy to be all of your kingdom friends. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your grace to us and your mercy to us. We often fail in so many ways and including our friendships. And Lord, I pray that uh, as we look at this imperfect but yet example of two friends who had you at the forefront and how you navigated this portion of their lives. God, I pray that you do that with us, Lord, that you would guide us. Give us wisdom in your plan for our lives. Help us to see one another, not just as that person that goes to church, but a fellow believer in Christ and who we are, a brother and sister in Christ for all eternity. And I pray that we would begin to build even more into our friendships, your purpose and your glory. God, I praise you for having friends that can be there in times of need for me. And I pray that uh, you would help me to be uh, strong in being that for other people. I pray that you would use us here at New Pal Bible to bring your glory throughout the earth and grow your kingdom. Amen.